Hey, this is His Word Unveiled. We are here to learn, to grow in the Lord, to dive in deeper, seriously, to just be changed. We're here doing the real stuff, the stuff that matters. So let's get into it. We're going to hit one chapter today in the book of John. So John chapter 2 is what this video will cover. So get away with the Lord, read through. This is the most important time, so let's take this seriously. Let's grab a hold of this opportunity and let God do something beautiful in us. John chapter 2 will be our reading for today. Take your time in this. Let it soak into your heart so deeply. Ask those questions. Really stop and think about what is going on and what God is trying to teach us, what he's speaking to us personally. Let's go for it. Let's seriously let this count. Let this count for something eternal, for his glory. Let's do this, John chapter two. Go get away and read. I'm gonna pray and we're gonna walk this thing out together and we're gonna learn and we're gonna be changed and we're gonna draw closer and closer to the heart of God. So here we go. Lord, we um, we come before you today with just humble hearts, God, with open hearts, just wanting to learn wanting to see, wanting to hear you. Father, we want to be changed. We don't want to waste a single moment of our lives doing things that just that just don't matter, doing things that 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 have no eternal significance. Lord, we're we're in this and we're choosing to do this and to be found in you so that our life can count for something beautiful, that it can hold purpose, that we can be led into more and more of you. Father, we want to see more. We want to have more. We want to be more in you as we discover more and more of your heart. So we just pray that you meet us here, that you teach us, be teacher, be our wisdom, be our insight. Um, just awaken us to your truth today as we walk through this chapter in John. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 2. So this hits Jesus' first miracle at the wedding um, <clears throat> the wedding at Cana. So let's get to it. The first uh, few verses talk about this wedding that's going on in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother is there, Mary, and Jesus and his disciples were invited as well. So whether this is a really close friend, whether it's a relative, we know that Jesus, his disciples, and his mother were there at the wedding. So at this wedding, the wine ran out. Now, this is like big disgrace, like big, this is like a wedding of reproach that they will be known for this when they run out of wine, like wine, it's the symbol of, of joy, of the celebration, of that this is this is the good stuff. This is the real stuff. And this culture wine was huge. So this wine ran out. And Jesus' mother, Mary, he, she approached Jesus and said, "Jesus, the, the, they're out of wine. They're they're out of wine." Just approaches him, lets him know this these facts. And Jesus says to her in verse four, "What does that have to do with us? My hour has not come." And calls her woman. Then doesn't call her mother but calls her out as woman, that Jesus is at the point of his life where his ministry, his public ministry has begun. Yet in that, as that's begun, his time has not come yet. And he's speaking this and saying, this is my purpose here. This is my time. This is what it's working up to. And my time is not here yet. And he's saying, what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with you? Why are you letting me know this? Why is this an urgency of you telling me that these people, their wedding, that they've got people taking care of this. This is, this is their, their issue of no wine. Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? Then Mary turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. So she's just on it, knowing her son, knowing Jesus can and will step in and do something because that's what he does. And he comes in and makes things better. He makes things beautiful. He transforms things. He changes things. He brings people into life. He being... Um, him being salvation. So Mary turns to the servant, says, whatever he says to you, do it. Verse six. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. So these water pots were significant. They were huge water pots. There were six pots there used for, again, the Jewish purification. So the washing of the hands in this this symbolizing being pure, this symbolizing this need of, of being cleansed, 
purify, making right so that they can move into more purpose. They can move into more depth. They can receive more. They can encounter more of these spiritual things. That's what these water pots were for, used for the Jewish custom of purification. So, of course, Jesus is going to use these, these objects that symbolize this, the use of being purified, the use of, of this purifying, this refining, this cleansing, also being the symbol of being filled with that which is um, pure, that which is uh, fully satisfied, which is all of the good stuff. So Jesus, his first miracle then, uses these six water pots that were used again for this purification. And he said to them, to these servants, fill the water pots. So fill these jars of purification with water that we're going to use them to serve the people in this purifying. This is why Jesus has come. He came to seek the lost. He came to heal the sick. He came to purify and cleanse and bring about restoration and bringing people into himself as our salvation. This is Jesus using these jars of purification, telling the servants then to fill them with water. So they filled them up to the brim. Not just put a little bit in or fill them halfway or fill them up to the brim so that they are absolutely full so that the lord's righteousness his purification his holiness his cleansing his goodness this is the charge that we be full of him that we fill ourselves to the brim that we are seeking after him choosing to know more of his truth praying to him thinking of him spending this time with him so that we are filled to the brim filled to the absolute max of all that Jesus is, that, that what fills, what, what makes Jesus' heart, that we are full of the things that make up his heart. So fill the water pots with the water. They filled them up to the brim in this obedience and listening to Jesus, they fill it up. Then Jesus said to them in verse eight, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. So what Jesus says is fill them up and draw some out. He wants us filled up with who he is so that he can draw out this goodness and impact the rest of the world and glorifying him and allowing this to be contagious, this purifying, this, this authenticity, this joy, this, this satisfaction and pleasure and filling the real kind of eternal, purposeful being filled. That this is what Jesus wants for us being filled so that he can draw us out. He can draw these things out of us and use us and work in us and stir things up in us and this constant just filling to the brim, overflowing and let it flow out, filling us more, keeping us absolutely full, completely satisfied. This is what Jesus says, fill them up so that, um, and then draw some out. Okay, so with this then, the servants who fill up these pots of water they draw them out and give them to the head waiter. So they tried this and tested the water, which had become wine. And he had no clue. He was amazed, didn't know where this came from. Went to the bridegroom and said, look, most people save their poorest wine. You know, the, the wine that's not so good till after everybody's drunk. And after everybody can't even think clearly on what it is and know the difference. They don't even know the difference. But he says, but you... You, speaking to the bridegroom, you've waited to bring out the very best until last. This working up, this, this kind of ultimate purpose here of working up to the very end and the very end. The best is always yet to come. The very end. The eternity end. The life with him end. The life where there's no sin end. That kind of eternity. That kind of being with Jesus forever and ever and on into eternity. Speaking of, speaking to the bridegroom, saying, you kept the best for last. You saved it up. You worked this up to be the very best wine for this time. Setting Jesus apart. Setting, that's what he does. That he keeps the best for last. He's not going to pour out these all these earthly rewards and all of this. If, if we got all of that, it would be easy to live for Jesus. 
but he keeps speaking to us. Hey, you just hold on. Hey, you just trust. Hey, you keep pressing into me. When this, this junk happens, you keep pressing in. You keep going and be assured that the best is yet to come. That best wine it's, it's at the very end. Most people have wasted their time with, with, this, with this wine and with this stuff of the world and this stuff of the world that they don't even realize then that the best is yet to come, that the best is so beyond this, that there's so much more. Yet the world throws all these pleasures now and we just get content and we just get snag, stagnant and we don't seek anymore and, and we feel like we don't need anymore. And Jesus says, no, the best is yet to come. That's how he operates. He says, those who continue to seek me daily, those who who remain faithful and devoted in their pursuit of me, in their pursuit of love, of what life really is, those who keep at it, they'll reap the rewards. They'll reap the rewards on into eternity. That's, That's what Jesus does. Okay, with that though, let's go back up to verse 9 then. And this says, then that when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. Now, when I read this, I was like, there is significance in this. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. And it says that this head waiter, he didn't know where this wine came from. He didn't know he didn't know how it came about this head waiter being the one who's kind of like that wedding planner who knew of everything he knew what was going on knew the things that were were happening knew the things that were set up he didn't know where this wine came from but the servants did not the main guy in charge of everything but those who were serving those who were following the Lord those who were obeying the Lord those who were by his side serving others they were the ones who knew how this miracle miracle came to be. They were the ones who knew that it started off water and now it's wine. They were the ones who saw. They were the ones who heard. They are the ones who believed because they saw, they knew firsthand of where this wine came from. When we seek him, when, when we when we follow him and in our obedience, in our obedience of Jesus, when we choose to stay by his side, to watch him, to not be so consumed with the party itself, with what's going on around us, but when we choose to stay by his side, seeking and following and obeying him, when we do that, we see, we truly see, we truly know, we, we truly encounter firsthand the miracles of the Lord that we position ourselves in this place of intimacy, that, that our position is one of intimacy, being an intimate part of his mighty hand at work. We're a part of it. We've seen it. We, we've seen what the Lord has done. We remain by his side, serving with him, loving him, being obedient, focused in on serving, on what he's doing on the behind the scenes stuff, not lifting anyone else up, but just remaining with Jesus. The servants knew. They knew where this came from. And it wasn't, you know, the rest of the wedding, they were like, yes, this wine's great. This is such a great wedding. How wonderful. Everyone's happy and celebrating and everything. All is well. All is great, fancy and and fabulous. But these servants, they experienced this wedding in, in so much more, with so much more intimacy. They saw it in a new way. They experienced more. They encountered more depth in that celebration, in that wedding. Those who were serving experienced more. They truly saw it. They got it. They knew where that wine came from. Verse 11, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. So after this wedding, they go down to Capernaum. Then it says in 13, the Passover Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Then he found people in the temple, those who were selling oxen. They were doing business. They were not honoring and respecting the house of the Lord, that this was to be a house of prayer and they're in there carrying on their business. They're selling things. They're making money. They're benefiting themselves. And Jesus, he sees this. As you guys read through this, Jesus is not a happy camper. He sees that he is full of this zeal. He is full of this, this, um, 
this passionate this passionate stirring within him that is making him crazy angry and seeing how the world how these people are distorting the truth the richness the power the intimacy of the house of God, of what this is for, to meet with the Lord and they're here benefiting themselves, selling things, has have their money out and, and these tables set up and, and all just doing business. In verse 16, and to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Doves. Now, when we read about doves, it's this this understanding of this, this sign of, of purity, this sign of um, of life. We see a dove being the symbol of the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus when he was baptized. And Jesus is saying, take this away. Stop making my father's house, this place of business. Stop making what was intended to be. Stop stripping it of its glory, of its power, of the life that it was intended to have. These doves, this symbol of what it is, and you're selling these. Almost like we're selling off the things that are important. We're not taking them seriously. We're allowing just the just the truth and the the um the the power of of what the house of God was for, of this meeting with the Lord, just allowing that power to just be stripped, allowing that that real, that richness to be just removed that they're in here just taking it lightly doing their own thing benefiting themselves not being serious not remaining focused not being drawn into the things that matter and jesus sees this and saying how dare how dare you distort what this is what this foundation is what this temple is supposed to be how it's supposed to draw people in to know a holy god and instead of that we're in here doing the stuff of the world, allowing this stuff to be brought in when this temple was to be this, this place of holiness that was to be set apart, that nothing, it was supposed to be sealed up as the glory of God fills the temple. It was supposed to be sealed up so that this kind of stuff that these people were doing, that it was shut out, that it was not allowed in, that it was no longer profane versus holy, but a holiness, just holiness, just, just God only God in his presence. And Jesus gets angry. It says that he came in, he made a scourge of cords, he drove them out, overturning their tables and calling them out for what they are doing. Because this is serious. We need to get angry at this kind of stuff, seeing the things of God being abused, being just distorted, being being just sent away. And people not just turning away from them, but taking a hold of them and, and causing them to just be the, this concept of it and, and just so much pollution and defilement and just distorting everything, everything that God had, had done and the reason and the purpose in this and the holiness of it and just denying it of its power and just and just saying, oh no, that's that's real cute, but no, we're in this and this is real life and making money and just the heaviness of that and what the world is doing and taking the things of God and and just distorting, just distorting the meaning, the the richness, the depth of it. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now in this, Jesus then overturning this, showing his anger, calling them out, turning them away. In this and only when the disciples see Jesus respond this way, do they remember these words that were spoken of him, that were written, zeal for your house will consume me. These words were written. They knew these words, but they didn't understand them at the time. It wasn't until they saw Jesus, they walked with him, they spent time with him. They saw how he lived his everyday life, the way he talked, the way he walked, the way he responded. And in, in that, in seeing that, in experiencing that firsthand with Jesus in a personal way, then they started understanding these things that were written, um, written about him. There may be words spoken by Jesus that we do not understand. We cannot get caught up on those words or truth. He speaks upon our lives that may not make sense to us. We can't get caught up on not understanding, on not knowing what they mean. What we must do, even without the understanding in the moment, 
is to hold these words close to our heart, to hang on every word that God says, even when we don't understand them. If he speaks something to us, as we're reading through the word and we don't understand, we've got to hold tight and know that God is at work. God will reveal it to us. God is speaking. He is moving. And we've got to hold on to every word that he speaks, everything that he speaks upon us and within us remembering those words. If the Lord gives us a word, then he will lead us into the fulfillment of that word, whatever it may be in his perfect timing. He will lead us into that fulfillment. What may not make sense at the time may be completely understood at a later time in the midst of a mighty movement of God in our lives. We've got to understand that they are his words. Therefore, they hold power. He is a faithful God and he will lead us into the understanding of that. The disciples probably had no clue what he was talking about or what it meant when they read, zeal for your house will consume me. But when they saw Jesus respond in that way with such a holy fire within him, that holy zeal, then they understood. Then they made sense to him. Guys, we can just, we could read a bunch of words and close up our Bible and go on our way and never know anything, you know, what they're really talking about, what they really mean. But when we read these, even when we don't understand in the moment and we continue seeking the Lord, spending time with him, seeing the way, learning the way that he lived his life, learning the way that he loves us. When we spend time with him, then the things we read that may not have made sense at one time, they will be brought to light. They will be revealed to us. They will make sense as we become more and more familiar with the heart of God, with how he walks and talks and, and who, who he is. Um, verse 18, the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? So they're saying, what right do you have to come in here and overturn this? Who do you think you are? What, what is a sign that you have for us, for us to know that you have the authority to do this? And in verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. He was speaking of his crucifixion and three days later, his resurrection saying, you destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Three days, he'll be resurrected. He will be brought to life. He's talking about the temple of his body. In this though, and hearing this, and the Jews just snapping back saying, you're crazy. It took this amount of years to build this up. Who are you to say that you can build this up in three days? Who do you think you are? But then we read in the next verse, verse 22. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. The words of the Lord are made clear as we spend time with him and become familiar with who he is and how holy his ways are. God's words come alive to us as we spend time in his presence. We can watch, we watch and we see and we hear the Lord living, how the Lord lived what he has done. We see his heart. We discover his heart. And as we spend time with him, these words are made clear. What he speaks to us, it is made clear, but we will never see them. We will never understand them. They will never be clear to us if we're not continuing to spend time with the Lord. If we hear it and we just move on and do our own thing, then, then that's it. That's the end of it. But if the Lord speaks something, as we read in his word and we continue to seek him throughout the day, remembering, reflecting, um, you know, just evaluating, praying and praising and declaring truth and, and going over his truth, as we become more and more familiar with him, then these words, they make sense. They come alive in our own lives, personally, penetrating our hearts in such a real way. Those things happen as we draw closer and closer to the Lord, as we go deeper and deeper with him. So, so beautiful. That, that's the truth. That's the reality. That's where the power comes. That his word is alive and active. It is powerful. And that power comes alive to us, in us, as we continue seeking him out. So good. Beautiful. That seriously did something in me. Okay, verse 23. 
Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So many were believing in his name, yet Jesus knew that all these who say, yeah, we believe, we're in, Jesus knows. Jesus knew, he saw, he sees us, he knows who is living life authentically. He knows those who are truly seeking him, seeking him just to know him, not to, not to be super spiritual or gain a title or to look good or appear great or, or, or everything's whatever. All of this that we do and the reasons why we do it, there's so much. There's so many people who say, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I love God. Yeah, I trust God, but do we? How many of us take the time to really think about, do we trust the Lord? Who are we worshiping? How are we spending our time? Where is our heart? What are we bowing down to every day of our lives? Jesus knows. He knows who is being authentic. He knows who is truly seeking him. He knows who is truly desiring more and more and more of who he is. And it says that many were believing in his name. Many. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men, that he is not believing, that Jesus is not naive. We can't fake Jesus out. Do we understand that? We can't play games. What's the point of playing games? Who cares if so-and-so thinks I'm a great Christian or not? Who cares if so-and-so saw me, you know, reading my Bible or heard me leading a prayer or saw me raise my hands in church? Who cares? It's, it's what's going on deep down inside. Are we being authentic when we leave, when no one else sees us, behind closed doors, when no one knows about it? How are we living life then? Are we raising our hands when no one sees? Are, are, we, are we fervently crying out to the Lord when no one hears? Are we hitting our knees? Are we opening up the word of God when no one else is, when no one is paying attention? Are we serving and loving and forgiving people even when we don't get recognition? That's where it's at. We cannot fake out the Lord. We cannot deceive him. We cannot hide these things from him. So why bother putting on a show in front of everyone else? We've got to get down to what matters. We've got to make this thing real. We've got to live our lives in such a real way, understanding that he sees us. He knows us and he's a righteous God and he will reward those who are authentically seeking him with all that they are, with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds that we are loving the Lord in everything we do and in every, in every circumstance that we face, in every position that we have, when, when everyone's around and when not a soul is around. How are we living our life? How real are we? How passionate is our pursuit of the Lord when no one is watching? Jesus knows. And he says, Jesus, it says Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men. Let's be real. Let's be absolutely real with where we're at with our pursuit of the Lord. He is a faithful God. He is a righteous God. Let's do this. Let's do life with him. Let's be that intimate part of the mighty, the mighty work of the Lord as those servants were. Let's be humble. Let's remain low. Let's keep seeking. Let's watch the Lord. Let's listen to him. Let's hear his voice. Let's receive his love. Let's receive his grace. Let's receive his truth. Let's stand on it and walk in it as we cling to the Lord. So good. So beautiful. That's one chapter full of truth, full of power. Let's just live this out. Let's walk this out. I pray that you have an amazing rest of the day with the Lord. That's it. We're finishing up with that verse or that chapter. Um, our next video, we're going to hit another chapter in John. So stick with me. Thanks so much for walking this out. I'll see you soon on my next video.